joining us today, and uh, thank you to my partners on this legislation, Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Jerry Nadler, Chair of the Judiciary Subcommittee on the Court's Intellectual Property and the Internet, Hank Johnson, and uh, Congressman Mondaire Jones, the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on the Court's Intellectual Property and the Internet. Uh, and uh, thank you to all of the activists and leaders who are here today. We're going to hear from Megan Hatcher Mays, the Indivisible, uh, Chris Kang, the co-founder of Demand Justice, uh, and uh, Professor Aaron Belkin, director of Take Back the Court. Uh, so we are here uh, as a coalition uh, beginning this effort uh, to ensure that we restore justice uh, to the Supreme Court. Um, this is uh, an incredible moment as we uh, introduce the Judiciary Act of 2021. We are here today because the United States Supreme Court is broken. It is out of balance uh, and it needs to be fixed. Too many Americans view our highest court in the land as a partisan political institution, not our Im impartial judicial branch of government. Too many Americans have lost faith in the court as a neutral arbiter of the most important constitutional and legal questions that arise in our judicial system. And I'm disappointed to say that too many Americans question the court's legitimacy. The consequence is that the rights of all Americans, but especially uh, people of color, women, and our immigrant communities are at risk. The concerns the American people have about the high court are legitimate and they are well-founded. The court is broken. And make no mistake about it, the court is broken because leader Mitch McConnell, his Senate Republican colleagues, and Donald Trump broke it. They violated historic norms governing Supreme Court appointments. They created a precedent that the Senate would not confirm a justice to the Supreme Court during a presidential year, refusing to give now Attorney General Merrick Garland a hearing and a vote. They held the seat open for months and months and then allowed Donald Trump to appoint Neil Gorsuch. They claimed that the proximity to a presidential election meant the seat had to be held open until the people, through their votes for president, could decide who should fill it. Senator McConnell even wrote that because we were, quote, in the midst of a presidential election process, we believe that the American people should seize the opportunity to weigh in on whom they trust to nominate the next person for a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court. Yet, four years later, just days before the 2020 presidential election, even while Americans were casting ballots, Leader McConnell and his Republican colleagues confirmed Amy Coney Barrett to the court to fill the seat held by the late great Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So much for letting the people weigh in. As a result, we have a stilted, illegitimate 6-3 conservative majority on the court that has caused this crisis of confidence in our country. The Republicans stole two seats on the Supreme Court, and now it is up to us to repair that damage. Our democracy is in jeopardy today because the Supreme Court's standing is sorely damaged. And the way we repair it is straightforward. We undo the damage that the Republicans have done by restoring balance. And we do it by adding four seats to the court to create a 13-member Supreme Court. These four new seats to be filled by President Biden will reconstitute the United States Supreme Court. The bench will then rightly reflect the values of the majority of the American people on whose behalf they serve. Expanding the court is constitutional. Congress has done it before, and Congress must do it again. We must expand the court 
and we must abolish the filibuster to do it. The words etched above the main entrance of the Supreme Court building behind us express the ultimate responsibility of the court. Equal justice under the law. But how will there be equal justice when seats on the court have been stolen? How will there be equal justice when Republicans have purposefully warped and weaponized the highest court of the land for their own partisan gain? Republicans seem to think that equal justice means justice for their purposes, their values, their causes. That is not equal justice. That is not the sacred duty of the Supreme Court. Expanding the Supreme Court rights the wrongs the Republicans have done to this great court. Expanding the Supreme Court is equal justice and will ensure equal justice is dispensed to all Americans. So now let me turn and uh, recognize the great chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, uh, Gerald Nadler. Thank you very much, Senator. First, I want to thank my friends and colleagues, Court Subcommittee Chairman Hank Johnson, Senator Markey, and Representative Jones for their leadership in introducing this bill. I also th want to acknowledge the work of the broad coalition of public interest groups supporting the bill and educating the public about an important reform to the structure of the Supreme Court, one that by historical standards is long overdue. Everything that Senator Markey said about the maneuvers of Senator McConnell and the Republicans delegitimizing the Supreme Court is obviously true. There is no justification. There can be no justification for what they did. And how can Americans look at the Supreme Court and expect it to do justice, to do equal justice, when it has been so severely politically and obviously politically manipulated? But some people will say, but the Supreme Court, it's always been nine members. But it hasn't. There's nothing new about changing the size of the Supreme Court. The Constitution leaves the number of justices up to Congress. And Congress has changed that number seven times in the history of the country. Our founders understood that as the country and the judicial system evolve, the court needs to evolve with it. And this legislation represents a much needed next step in that evolution. Many people think that about the Supreme Court in terms of its individual members and their right to do so. But it's also the fact that in addition to what we were referring to a few minutes ago uh, in terms of the legitimacy of the court, the efficiency of the court is another question. Nine justices may have made sense in the 19th century when there were only nine circuits. Only a few hundred appeals were filed before the court every year. And so many of our most important laws, everything from civil rights to antitrust, the internet, financial regulation, health care, immigration, and white collar crime simply did not exist as far as the court was concerned and did not require adjudication by the Supreme Court. But the logic behind having only nine justices is much weaker today when there are 13 circuit courts, thousands of cases filed before the court each year, and the full range of statutes and regulations that make our economy and our society work. And that's why, unlike through most of our history, the Supreme Court accepts certiorari, accepts cases, in a tiny, tiny fraction of cases. And that means that most cases, the vast majority of cases, the overwhelming majority of cases, don't get considered by the Supreme Court, which they are entitled to do, and throughout much of our history, did. Our predecessors made eminent sense when they, rigged, when they pegged the size of the Supreme Court to the number of judicial circuits. As our country has grown, so too to the Supreme Court. Thirteen justices for thirteen circuits is a logical progression. And that is another reason why I'm glad to join my colleagues in introducing the Judiciary Act of 2021 to establish the Supreme Court size as thirteen. Uh, that's a nice number. It matches, it's not a nice number. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a proper number. It matches the number of circuits as it has historically and it also will enable us to do justice and to rectify the great injustice that was done in packing the court. And t some people will say we're packing the court. We're not packing it, we're unpacking it. Senator McConnell and the Republicans packed the court over the last couple of years, as Senator uh, uh, Markey outlined. So this is a, a, a reaction to that. It's a necessary step in the evolution of the court 
and I'm glad to, I'm proud to co-sponsor it. And now let me introduce our, uh, 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 one of our co-sponsors, Congressman Hank Johnson, who's one of the authors of this legislation. Excuse me. Hank. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Nadler, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, Senator Markey, Representative Jones, I'm Congressman Hank Johnson, and I have the privilege of chairing the House Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Internet. As a criminal defense lawyer for 27 years and a magistrate court judge for 12 of those years uh, prior to coming to Congress, 27 years as a criminal defense lawyer. I have a great deal of respect for the judicial branch, the third co-equal branch of government, the, and the independence of the court is critical. Most folks assume that the Constitution mandates the number of justices on the Supreme Court must be nine, but nowhere in the Constitution is it written just how many justices should sit on the Supreme Court. I would submit that the reason why the framers did not enumerate how large the court should be is because they envisioned that the legislative branch would need to have flexibility in tending to the court's operations from time to time. So the Constitution does not require that there be a nine justices sitting on the Supreme Court. The fact is that Congress has changed the size of the Supreme Court seven times over the course of the nation's history. The first time, in fact, only 13 years after the Constitution was ratified, when the presidency and Congress were still governed by our country's founding generation. The real outlier is the fact that the court hasn't changed while the rest of the federal government has grown, keeping pace with the growth of the nation. Many of the earlier changes in the number of justices were made specifically in response to national growth. In 1807, for example, a Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals was added when Kentucky, Tennessee, and Ohio were added to the Union, and a new justice was added to the Supreme Court. Bringing, bringing the total number of justices to seven. But this natural expansion stopped after the Civil War, leaving us today with the historical oddity of 13 circuit courts of appeal and only nine justices. I believe it's time to go back to this tradition and have at least 13 justices. With 13 justices, each justice would be able to have responsibility for emergency applications for a single circuit instead of the current status quo where one justice covers three circuits, two justices cover two, and the remaining six justices cover one. We recently held a hearing on this docket, what, what um, some have called the Supreme Court's shadow docket because of the court's recent tendency to issue orders on that docket that have enormous impact, but which in stark contrast to normal practice might not be accompanied by an opinion explaining the court's reasoning, even if some justices dissent. I'm hopeful that by spreading this work out among more justices, there will be more capacity to appropriately deal with emergencies, including explaining the court's reasoning in important cases, Bring, bringing transparency and light to this increasingly important part of the Supreme Court's practice is necessary. I'm also hopeful that additional justices will allow the Supreme Court to hear more cases in a given term. There is an enormous disparity in the number of cases heard by the courts of appeals and the Supreme Court. In 2019, the Courts of Appeals decided more than 50,000 appeals. In contrast, the Supreme Court has decided fewer than 100 cases in recent terms. In 100 cases, 
100 cases decided as a percentage of 50,000 cases dealt with by the courts of appeals is a paltry 0.02%. This disparity means that getting a case in front of the Supreme Court starts to resemble winning the lottery for anyone without connections. This scarcity has led to a cottage industry where litigants who can afford to do so spend enormous time and enormous energy and enormous money in rallying others to file friend of court briefs, amicus briefs, to urge the Supreme Court to agree to hear a case. I have serious concerns, ladies and gentlemen, about whether a two-tiered justice system has developed, one reserved for marquee cases, white shoe, white shoe lawyers, and wealthy litigants, and one for everyone else. In sum, it's time that we start thinking about the Supreme Court like we think about the rest of the federal government and consider whether and how its current composition allows it to effectively do what we need it to do, which is to efficiently and effectively administer justice and uphold the rule of law. I'm pleased to join my colleague, Senator Markey, Chairman Nadler, and Representative Jones in taking an important step in that direction today with the introduction of the Judiciary Act of 2021, which I'm proud to sponsor. And now I'm happy to turn the podium over to my colleague and vice chair of the subcommittee on courts, intellectual property, and the internet, Representative Mondaire Jones from New York. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Chairman for your leadership. And of course, my friend, Senator Markey, who has led on this as he has led on so many other important issues uh, with great political courage and an understanding of the, the needs of the American people. Uh, I wish we did not have to stand here today. I wish we didn't have a far right Supreme Court majority that is hostile to democracy itself. But here we are. And the fact is, if we want to save our democracy, we must act before it is too late by restoring balance to the Supreme Court. Our democracy faces its greatest test since Jim Crow. From the insurrection at the Capitol to the racist voter suppression being attempted all throughout the United States of America, the far right is at war with our democracy. And what I want people to understand is that this crisis did not arrive overnight. Rather, the Supreme Court has been an accomplice. In fact, the Supreme Court, specifically the Roberts Court, has been working to dismantle our democracy for years. One decision at a time, the right-wing majority on the Supreme Court has unraveled the greatest achievements of the civil rights movement. To produce a government that does not look like, understand, or even pretend to represent the American people. Every time we needed the Roberts Court to stand up for government by the people, the court chose government by the powerful. In its Citizens United decision in the year 2010, it opened the floodgates to a torrent of dark corporate money in our elections. Years later, three years later, in fact, in Shelby County v. Holder, the Roberts Court gutted the crown jewel of the Voting Rights Act, which set the stage for what we are now seeing with SB 202 in Georgia and other racist attempts to suppress the right of Americans to vote in this country. Of course, more recently, in 2019, a decision called Rucho v. Common Cause, the Supreme Court, specifically the Roberts Court, gave a green light to partisan gerrymandering, further entrenching minority rule. Shamefully, the Roberts Court has never struck down a single voter suppression law as unconstitutional. Not a single one. My goodness. Decisions like these have created a path for the far right to remain in power, despite being roundly and repeatedly rejected by the American people. It is simply a fact that Republican presidential candidates have lost the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections. 
Yet only four of the last 19 Supreme Court justices have been appointed by Democratic presidents. So let's be clear. The far right did whatever it could to capture the court. They invented a non-existent rule to hold open Merrick Garland's seat for 14 months before confirming Neil Gorsuch. And they violated their own rule just four years later to confirm Amy Coney Barrett. While an election was already underway, votes were already being tabulated. The far right will now do whatever it can to maintain its grip on power. Today, bolstered by the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett, this court will go further than any other in modern American history to rig our democracy in favor of the far right and the special interests that bankroll them. In doing so, the far right conservative majority will maintain minority rule for generations to come. That is, unless we stop them. In his parting words to this nation, the late Congressman John Lewis said, democracy is not a state. It is an act. And each generation must do its part. That is why today we are introducing the Judiciary Act of 2021 to act, to do our part. Our bill is simple. It adds four justices to the U.S. Supreme Court. When those seats are filled, we will finally have a court committed to government by the people. The Constitution, for its part, is clear. When the Supreme Court will not respect the will of the people, Congress has the power and the duty to expand the Supreme Court. And in fact, as you have heard today, Congress has done it seven times before. Expanding the court is not about political parties. Justices John Paul Stevens and David Souter were Republicans and they were appointed by Republican presidents of the United States. They were committed to the rule of law and to the right of everyone in this country to vote. Not so today. Court expansion then is about saving our democracy. Expanding the court would restore our right to choose the world that we wish to live in. We can still have a democracy if we fight for it. And that is precisely what we are doing today through the introduction of this bill. Thank you. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Just minutes before you all came out here, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said that she has no plans on bringing this bill up to the floor. So where exactly do you go from here? And were you disappointed by the Speaker's comments? Um, my view is that um, we are in an historic situation uh, where this court is a 6-3 court uh, because of illegitimate actions taken by a Republican um, United States Senate and uh, a Republican president. Uh, the harm that that uh, court is going to be able to do across a whole range of issues, voting rights, woman's right to choose, environmental um, uh, issues, issue after issue are now in jeopardy. So my belief is that it's absolutely imperative that we introduce this legislation uh, because it's going to become clear as decision after decision emanates from this Supreme Court uh, that there needs to be uh, a historic balance which is restored. Uh, and uh, so we begin this debate, we begin this discussion today, uh, but it does not end here. And I believe that ultimately, uh, it's going to be very clear that this legislation has to pass. I will turn it over to I'll, I'll, us. I'll, I'll, I'll agree. Uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi is a very good judge of, uh, of events. Oh, sorry. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, I agree with Senator Markey. Speaker Pelosi is a very good, good judge of events and of, and of history. And I believe that as events unfold, as the court comes down, with decisions destructive to a woman's right to choose, as they come down with decisions destructive to, uh, to the climate, as they come down with, the condition, with uh, decisions destructive of civil liberties. I believe that uh, Speaker Pelosi and others will, uh, 
will come along. Chairman, the, may I just before? And, and it, it's it's my fault. Okay, but uh, do we have three other speakers who I would like yeah. to uh, to come to the podium first? And we'll begin with uh, Megan Hatcher Mays, the director of Demar Democracy Policy at Indivisible. Thank you. Apologize. That's okay. Thank you, Senator Markey. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to Representative Jones, uh, Representative Nadler, Representative Johnson, and of course, Senator Markey for uh, their leadership on this bill today. My name is Megan Hatcher Mays. I'm the Director of Democracy Policy at Indivisible and the founder of the Unrig the Courts Coalition, a coalition um, dedicated to restoring balance to the courts which of course starts right here today with the introduction of the Judiciary Act of 2021. Um, the Supreme Court derives its legitimacy from the trust that we all put into it. Um, and that trust has been eroded thanks to a decades long assault on our judiciary in general and the Supreme Court in particular <clears throat> by corporate interests, conservative dark money groups, and the Republican enablers in Congress. The last four years especially showed just how little regard um, Republicans led by Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell have for an apolitical judiciary. Trump and McConnell confirmed hundreds of judges, including three Supreme Court justices, all of whom were handpicked because, uh, because of their loyalty not to the Constitution, but to conservative political outcomes. The only way forward now, the only way to build back trust in our courts and in the Supreme Court especially, is to add seats. So let me be clear, uh, no, no one here today, no one standing behind me today, uh, woke up this morning and thought, you know what might be fun? Uh, what if we added four seats to the Supreme Court? For no reason, I just think it might be a fun thing to do. That's not what happened. Uh, we are here because Mitch McConnell overplayed his hand. He and Donald Trump got greedy and the American people noticed. First, McConnell had held a Supreme Court seat open for over a year just to fill it with Neil Gorsuch, a man with uh, very strong ties to conservative dark money groups uh, and who those same groups spent millions of dollars to have him confirmed. Then Mitch McConnell bent over backwards to confirm Brett Kavanaugh. I don't think we need to relive all of the ways in which that man is hideously unqualified to serve on the bench. And then Mitch McConnell confirmed Amy Coney Barrett, a woman who refused to say whether or not climate change is real, eight days before the November election and after tens of millions of people had already voted. These are hardly the actions of a man or a political party who now claim to revere an apolitical court system. Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump have pushed our democracy to the cliff's edge and the conservatives on the Supreme Court are ready to finish the job and push it right on over that cliff. So we have to address this issue before it's too late. Uh, Indivisible is proud to endorse and support the Judiciary Act of 2021, and I know we can get this done. So thank you so much. Uh, turn it over to Chris Kang from Demand Justice. Thank you very much, Megan. I'm Chris Kang, the co-founder and chief counsel of Demand Justice. And I'm here to declare that Democrats are done ceding the Supreme Court to Republicans. And there's no better evidence of that than having the honor of standing here with the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Mr. Nadler, chairman of the House Court Subcommittee, Mr. Johnson, vice chair of the Court Subcommittee, Mr. Jones, and Senator Markey, whose experience has consistently demonstrated that existential crises demand existential solutions. We have a Supreme Court that is tilted to partisan, biased corporate interests, and we must restore balance by adding four seats to the court. No one can argue that a 6-3 ultra-conservative Republican supermajority is a balanced court. A court with five white men that has never had a black woman justice, an Asian American justice, a Native American justice is not balanced. A court that has not had a lawyer as a justice who has defended criminal defendants since Thurgood Marshall more than three decades ago is not balanced. We have a looming crisis of legitimacy in the Supreme Court, but the existential crisis we have is much greater. It's an existential crisis toward democracy itself. These Republican justices have consistently undermined voting rights and fair elections. 
from gutting the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County to Citizens United to partisan gerrymandering to purging voter rolls to making it harder to vote during the pandemic, time and time again, these Republican justices have sided with partisan interests and not with the people. Already 361 voter suppression bills have been introduced in 47 states across the country. Our very democracy hangs in the balance of this fundamentally unbalanced Supreme Court. Now, that's why Demand Justice is proud to stand here in support of the Judiciary Act of 2021. And this is not the first Judiciary Act that the Congress has considered. The framers and the Constitution itself gave Congress the power to set the size of the Supreme Court, which it did so in the first Judiciary Act of 1789, which set the court at six seats. And it did so seven more times, changing the size of the Supreme Court, the last time being the Judiciary Act of 1869, which currently sets it at nine. Now is the time for the Judiciary Act of 2021 to expand the Supreme Court and to restore balance. Now, we know that this isn't going to be an easy fight and that there's work to do. We're prepared to go neighbor to neighbor, friend to friend, member to member, senator to senator, until we gain a majority of support in both the House and the Senate to pass this legislation. We have momentum and a movement on our side, as demonstrated by the fact that voters who declared that the Supreme Court was an important issue in November voted for President Biden by a six-point majority, a dramatic reversal from 2016. And we only have to look at the trajectory of the debate over filibuster reform to see how quickly and how necessary this conversation also will be. A year ago, filibuster reform was a fight that had a handful of champions and a long way to go. Well, today we have a handful of champions and we're prepared to go that long distance. Our democracy depends on it. We need to not only eliminate the filibuster to pass democracy reform and to pass voting rights, but we need to pass Supreme Court reform so that those fundamental improvements to our democracy stand the test of time. I'm so honored to be here and I'm looking forward to joining this fight. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Aaron Belkin of Take Back the Court. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you so much to the leaders behind me, Senator Markey, Chairman Johnson, Chairman Nadler, and Representative Jones. I am marveling at all of us being together today. I started Take Back the Court two and a half years ago to urge anyone who would listen to focus on the threat of the court and to understand that the only path toward restoring democracy, the only way to prevent the people in this building from blocking black and brown Americans from voting is to expand the court. And it was a really lonely road back then. There was almost no support. And I am so proud and so grateful that fast forwarding two and a half years to today, we have champions behind us. We have more than 50 organizations, mostly black and brown led organizations, calling for expansion of the Supreme Court. I'm actually glad that a question was asked before our remarks because I've heard a lot of people, even on the left, expressing pessimism and saying that we've lost the courts for a generation. No, we haven't lost the courts for a generation. I come out of more than 20 years of advocacy on LGBT military issues. And when I got into the fight against Don't Ask, Don't Tell, people said that was unwinnable. Seven years ago, when I launched the campaign to repeal the transgender military ban, people said that fight was unwinnable. We are gonna win the fight to rebalance the Supreme Court because we have to. Progressive fights are always hard, but if we don't win this fight, January 6th is going to be our future, and it's going to be the tip of the iceberg of our future. Stolen elections are going to be our future. Suppression, actually not just of black and brown votes, but of white Republican votes as well. Voter suppression affects them as well. That's going to be our future as well. I believe that if our democracy survives, future generations will look back to today, and they will look at Senator Markey, at Chairman Nadler, at Chairman Johnson, at Representative Jones, at Indivisible, 
and demand justice. And they will recognize folks who not only saw the threat of the stolen court, but who had the bravery to do something about it. Thank you so much for coming today, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor. Yes, questions? Yeah, Chairman, Chairman Adler, do you plan to mark this bill up in the Judiciary Committee anytime soon? Well, we'll have to see where it fits on our schedule, but I would anticipate it. Will you plan to push this bill as part of an infrastructure initiative, given that uh, Representative Jones tweeted that this is infrastructure? <laughs> I appreciate the question about Supreme Court expansion as infrastructure. Uh, look, I was sort of making fun of the ongoing debate we are having right now, uh, but I, I mean it to the extent that we must have a democracy in order for us to have health care in the midst of a pandemic, uh, for voting rights to be secured for everyone who is eligible to vote. And unfortunately, we can't have those nice things with the far right supermajority on the Supreme Court behind me. So, you know, <laughs> interpret it as you will. Uh, it was meant half jokingly. Uh, but I do mean Supreme Court expansion to be something that is foundational uh, to anything that Congress wants to do, and certainly that is popularly supported by the American people. And I do want to bolster something that the Judiciary Committee Chairman said earlier about how as events unfold, people do come around to certain ideas. Uh, look, I, I would have been shocked if the Speaker had said that she would uh, allow a floor vote on this today, and nor would I want that. We haven't been able to have conversations with all of our colleagues to get the support required to pass the bill. Uh, so I I'm not concerned by what the Speaker said today, and I say that as a member of the House Democratic leadership team myself. And certainly the American people deserve to hear more about why this is important to having a democracy in the United States of America. Republican votes, you would need to get this through the Senate, assuming it gets to the, the, the House floor and passes. And do you worry that by putting this marker down now, uh, you it, it just works uh, works against you and, and, and in, enrages the, the right and the Fox News, the OAN world that's going to put this that could put this on you know repeat for weeks? Well, ultimately, we have to repeal the filibuster, uh, and then uh, we can move this legislation as. They can move the legislation in the House of Representatives right now with a majority of the votes. So we begin the case today. Clearly, we would want Republicans to vote with us. But if they are not willing to uh, participate in that effort, then we can still do this uh, on, a, um, uh, on a basis of 51 votes. And that will ultimately require a, a repeal of the filibuster and then uh, passage uh, of this legislation with 51 votes. So we begin the effort today. All issues go through three phases, political education, political activation, uh, political implementation. So we begin the education of the American people today. Uh, and it, it will become more clear as each month goes by, as each decision emanates from the Supreme Court, uh, that a fundamental historical imbalance has been created uh, and it needs to be rectified. But the solution ultimately uh, will entail a repeal of the filibuster. Um, well, again, we're beginning the process today uh, so that the debate about this issue begins today so that the American people, and that's what polling uh, makes clear, is the more people understand this issue is the more likely they are to support ex an expansion of the court. So we begin the effort today. Uh, and uh, President Biden is operating on a separate track uh, and uh, we await his commission, but we don't wait for the introduction of the solution. That is what we are doing here today. I, just, I, I want to make the observation that I, I appreciate the president's understanding of the urgency of this, is, hence his convening of the commission. Uh, notice that in the instruction to the commission, which is supposed to um, put together a report analyzing the debate, uh, that there is no instruction that it make recommendations, which I found to be interesting. Uh, additionally, the damage has already been done. We don't need a commission to tell us that we need to restore balance to the, por the, the court in order to do any number of things, uh, from my perspective and the perspective of many people here today, uh, save our democracy. 
Uh, so I, I appreciate the, the commitment to further discussion that the president has. I think it speaks to the urgency of this issue. Um, but it should not stop us from doing what we know to be necessary with respect to this. How much support is there if you're still in the education phase and getting support? How much support are you starting with right now? Well, we can't answer that question. We're just starting. Today is the very beginning of uh, discussion of that issue, of, of this entire issue. So uh, we'll see as it develops. We anticipate that as... Uh, it becomes clear to the American people just how stacked the court is and the, ba and the damage that the court ha is doing. Uh, it will become more clear and we will get the support. Yeah, excuse me, Jerry. Let me... I'd like to respond to that question also. Uh, fact is that today begins a new era in terms of the Supreme Court. Uh, it's been taken for granted for so long that the court has to be nine people. That's like baked into our psyche. And, um, and there simply is no need to continue with a nine-person court given the circumstances that have been expressed by uh, all of the voices that you've heard today. There's a need for reform of the Supreme Court and all of its processes. And it may not be as popular today as it will be as we move forward. I mean, every single term of the court, the court will be looked at in terms of what it does. And our future, future under this Supreme Court uh, is not something that people, uh, many people are looking forward to. Some are actually fearful of losing rights uh, under our Constitution. And so... This is a uh, movement that has begun. It began before today, but today is, a, uh, is an important moment in this movement. And I believe that uh, this movement will pick up support. I believe right now there is significant support uh, among uh, members of the House of Representatives on the Democratic side. Uh, there's significant uh, support uh, probably on... Uh, in the U.S. Senate, uh, but the issue has not been brought to the forefront. And uh, so it's important that this start be made. Uh, we start the conversation in a very public way, and the American people uh, have an opportunity to weigh in on this debate. This is a debate that uh, is not just uh, us here in, in Congress. This is a debate for the American people, and so I'm so happy to stand with all of the stakeholders out here who are bringing it to the attention of the people. The people are watching this United States Supreme Court, and the court needs to know that the people are watching. Last question. Any other questions? Thank you all so much. Thank you. Very good. Great job, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you so much.